Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you could uh, you could join me uh, this morning at the uh, NEI conference 2017. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I am the former visual information specialist at Katmai National Park. I am enjoying a semi-retirement right now, as I like to call it. Uh, so I'm not officially representing any national park at the moment. I, I've worked at many national parks during my career, most recently last summer at North Cascades, and then I spent several years as a visual information specialist at Katmai National Park. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk th during this session uh, about a, well, I can't really call it a project, but I think a way to really shift the paradigm mm -hmm. about how we can engage uh, remote audiences, people that can't really physically visit our park. There are ways to engage them. Um, and I think webcams uh, can be a game changer in, in that sense. Uh, we are broadcasting this live on the Explore.org bear cams. So uh, if for those of you watching online, you can uh, you know, chat with uh, one of my co-presenters who unfortunately wasn't able to join us during, this, during the session. So uh, that is uh, Roy Wood, who's currently the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Shenandoah National Park. So he'll be in the comments on Explore.org to answer your questions. And if you're watching on Explore.org through Facebook Live, you can go there and ask me your <coughs> questions. So I'll be happy to try to add his insight into the webcam experience and how it can be made more effective and how effective it actually it actually is. Uh, I am curious to know, though, um, does anybody work at a park that has a webcam currently? OK. I know Katmai, a couple Katmai <laughs> alums here. All right. And yes, ma'am ma in the back. Where do you work at? Uh, well, I work for Wildlife Rehab Center. Oh, OK. We have cameras on some of our wildlife patients because people can't necessarily go on into okay. black bear and rehab or anything. So, OK, awesome, yeah. awesome. Um, anywhere else? I thought I saw another hand. Yes. Um, the Darling National Wildlife Park page. Oh, awesome. OK, great. And then um, is anybody considering a webcam at their park? A few of you? I was hoping I'd see your hand up. Okay. Um, so I, I, for those of you who uh, don't have webcams, um, I'm hoping to convince you by the end of the, the session that you want to have a webcam at your national park, and you want to be interpreting to the audience online. Um, and for those of you who maybe have webcams, uh, hopefully I'll give you some uh, perspectives and insight into making that experience uh, or allowing it to reach its full potential. Because uh, as I kind of envision things, I see a paradigm with how we built stewardship in national parks uh, over the course of mo most of its history. And that paradigm is we need to get people to national parks so they become stewards of this place. We had to build infrastructure to allow them access, campgrounds, roads, trails, uh, give them access to these exceptional experiences and the spectacle that make national parks uh, important places. Uh, and interpretation, of course, played a really important role in that. Uh, park rangers giving people meaningful experiences in the park, helping them to find meaning in the, the resources at national parks. So the typical paradigm was get people physically to the park so they can understand the place, become aware of it, um, and become stewards of it. And of course, interpretation in national parks uh, played a major role in that. Uh, there's also, I think, a paradox sort of associated with wildlife viewing in national parks. Though We had our paradigm of visiting, and then we have our people who want to come to see wildlife. And in fact, if you have a, a, a park or a nature center or something with animals, I can almost guarantee you the majority of the people that go there want to see animals. Uh, studies from Yellowstone National Park Denali National Park show that at least 80% uh, or more of people uh, going to these places during the summertime spent some time watching animals. And it's even higher for Katmai. And I'll talk about that uh, in, the, in just, a, just a little bit. But having people visit national parks to see wildlife isn't always great for wildlife. There can be a lot of issues associated with wildlife viewing. Uh, people have a significant impact on large mammals, especially like brown bears. So people want to go to national parks to see wildlife, but their presence, their physical presence, can alter the behavior and biology of these animals. So that's, in my mind, the paradox of wildlife viewing. And I think webcams can help to bridge those barriers. 
Katmai National Park is significant for a lot of different reasons. It was the site of the largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century, the largest on Earth since uh, 1814 with uh, <coughs> Tambora. Oh. Yes, yeah, yeah, Tambora in Indonesia. A known volcanic eruption on Earth has exceeded it since then. So this is the largest volcanic eruption in the last uh, 200 plus years. It created the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, a spectacular 45 square mile valley filled with pumice. Katmai is a, largely a wilderness park. It's over 4 million acres in size. There are virtually no trails and no roads in, in the area. There's only about six miles of trail within this park. It has 400 miles of coastline. But when you ask people to describe Katmai, and I actually I should probably ask you, uh, <coughs> If you know about Katmai National Park, how would what what is the one thing that you think of when you think of Katmai? Bears. Yeah, bears. <laughs> bears are Katmai's flagship species. So millions of salmon run into uh, into the waters of Katmai National Park each year, and Katmai supports over two thousand, at last estimate, over two thousand brown bears. So it has some of the highest densities of brown bears anywhere on Earth, and it offers exceptional opportunities. For people to view these animals uh, and have a, nearly a guaranteed uh, brown bear viewing experience. If you go to a, a lot of places that have grizzly bears like Denali or Yellowstone, it's not a guarantee that you're going to be able to see those animals. But if you go to Katmai in the right season and you pick a guide, a lot of the, even the bear viewing guides at Katmai will guarantee that you will see brown bears. It's not actually that difficult to find brown bears in Katmai. You just need to find where the salmon are spawned. So I was fortunate enough to work at Brooks River, at Brooks Falls, um, where we can take pictures like this very easily. This, I mean, these are just pictures that you take with a point-and-shoot camera. Um, and I, did, I have tens of thousands of, of photos of brown bears fishing out of waterfall. So it's not difficult to go and take pictures of brown bears at, at Brooks River. So this is kind of like the scene that everyone thinks of when they think of Katmai National Park. Like I said, it's a very remote place. It's at the head of the Alaska Peninsula. It's over 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, and it's only accessible by plane or boat. There are virtually no roads in the area. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry, I think yeah. back here we can't really see the screen too well because there's a light directly on it. So could I see the area or the picture? Do you mind if I'm screening? Yeah, well, it's kind of a. Yeah, well, let's. Um, Sorry, there's seats up front. Okay. Yeah, please, if you can't see in the back, please come up front. I'll be happy to um, try to modify the room as, as, as best I can. But please, please come up if you can't if you can't see. I am I am streaming this uh, live on the internet. So no, I, I appreciate you bringing that to my concern. Sorry. If I yeah, that's all right. <laughs> no problem. Um, so yeah, Katmai National Park is a very remote place. There are almost no roads, no trails. Most of the visitation is centered around uh, Brooks River in, in Katmai. Uh, this. This is the whole park in total gets maybe thirty to forty thousand people a year. They're flying in almost exclusively using air taxis. A few people might arrive by boats, but it's it's a hard place to get to. It's not accessible to the general population for a variety of, of reasons, and we'll talk about some of those barriers in just a little bit. Brooks River, though, gets uh, about a third of the visitation. So if you have thirty thousand people visiting, then about ten thousand people <coughs> are going to to visit Brooks River. And the river itself isn't very big. It's only a mile and a half. So it's a very short river. Uh, in, in the scheme of things, over the past couple of years, there's been around 11,000 people visiting Brooks River uh, the past two summers. And that doesn't seem like a lot compared to a lot of national parks in the lower 48 states. Uh, the visitor center at Old Faithful gets over 10,000 people a day during peak season. So. You think, well, they don't get anybody there. But this is a very <laughs> intensively managed place. Extremely intensively managed. Because along this mile and a half river, you can have two to three dozen brown bears and two to three hundred people. So that's that creates the potential for a lot of, di a lot of different conflict. Uh, so this is a, a, a very special place. It's a very ecologically sensitive place. It does attract uh, people from all over the world. And again, Katmai had the uh, it lived within the paradigm of kind of building stewardship in national parks for uh, for most of its history. 
You had to get people physically through this place so they would experience it, find meaning with these brown bears, and then work to protect it uh, in the future. So there are wildlife viewing platforms at the river, and uh, people are generally free to go where they want. This is one of the least restricted, well-known brown bear viewing locations on Earth. So there are actually very few restrictions on where you can go at Brooks River. So people, can, uh, when they're visiting, can have, uh, of course, a significant impact on the animals uh, at, at Brooks River. There are costs to visiting this place that most people can't, uh, can't overcome. These statistics come from in-depth visitor surveys done by Washington State University, and you can look those up online. The one from Catline I have cited at the bottom, um, so this is from the, the 2015 study. Uh, Mount Rainier National Park, summer of 2012, they uh, evaluated the cost of people visiting Mount Rainier uh, within, I think, in money spent within a 50 mile radius. So the numbers aren't quite equivalent, but there's, there's some similarities there. So I picked Mount Rainier because that's a park that is accessible to an urban population, a large urban population. Very easy access to drive from Seattle to Mount Rainier. You can do a day trip from there fairly easily. You want to look at another park that's relatively inaccessible and fairly expensive to get to is Yellowstone in the wintertime. Yellowstone in the wintertime, it does cost quite a bit of money to go there. And I think this evaluated uh, the money that people spent uh, per person and per group within a 150 mile radius of, of uh, Yellowstone in the winter. So uh, significant amounts of money being spent to visit Yellowstone, but nothing even comes close to visiting Alaska and Katmai. So the average group cost to visit Alaska and Katmai in 2014 was $7,600 per group. The average expenditure per person, $3,720 per group. And that's not affordable for the general population. How many people were in those groups? Like, is that like a family board? Yeah, actually, so the average group size for, for these was a, um, 40 to 50% for each one of these surveys were groups of two. And then there was up to 25% that were groups of three. So not particularly large. Uh, the percentage of the percentage of uh, larger groups was it was I think highest for Mount Rainier, so close to a city, easy for families to visit. Yellowstone in the winter time, not a lot of families visit there. Um, I spent a winter at Old Faithful. And, yeah, you see a lot of adults there. Um, you don't happen to see a lot of a lot of kids in the winter. There's a few, but not not a whole lot. Um, and then in Katmai, we almost never saw kids, and I. I Cat my lungs, correct me if I'm wrong, if that's changed over the past couple of summers, but we, it was rare for us to see a child at Brooks Camp. So we would, if you had a kid in your program, you'd be like, oh crap, I got a kid on my, on my valley, 10,000 folks to What am I going to do now? I'm not prepared for this. So, so it's very different demographic. Um, it's expensive to get to, and this is one of these major barriers that prevents people from visiting Alaska. Our typical Brooks Camp visitor um, has a household income that's actually very high. Uh, so for those of you in the back who maybe have trouble seeing this, the household income, average household income, is 25% um, reported over $200,000 as a household income, and 45% reported, self-reported 75,000 to 199,000 as their household income. So generally these are high income households that are visiting Catalan. Uh, the demographics of them, usually groups of two, so for Katmai, groups of 54% uh, said they were just coming in, in groups of two. 56% were of, of the baby boomer generation, so they're between 51 and, and 70 years old. Um, and there's nearly a one-to-one -one split between male and female visitors at Katmai. So it, that uh, reflects the general population at, uh, at large, at least the, the difference between the genders. And what are people coming to do at Katmai? Well, they're coming to see bears. They want to see lots of bears. In fact, that, that 2014, uh, uh, that survey from 2014, uh, it asked the question, what, what was your primary reason for visiting Katmai National Park? And eight out of 10 people said, I came specifically to watch brown bears. Another 5% said I came to, for photography. And what are, what are they photographing? Bears. They're, they're photographing bears. <laughs> Another 14% said, I'm coming to fish. So fishing is a popular activity in Catlin National Park. There was like maybe 2% or something that said they were coming for a different reason. So again, bears are Katmai's flagship species. No matter what we talk about, bears are the hook 
for us to engage audiences. If we can work our interpretive messages around theirs, we get people interested in and all these other really cool things uh, about Katmai. But bear, we can't ignore brown bears at Katmai. That's really what the audience is, is coming here to see. At the park, though, when people do visit, they have uh, a impact on the wildlife. Rangers at Brooks River work very hard to keep people at appropriate distances uh, from, from the animals. But even our physical presence at the river has an impact on them. Because you can think of bears as you know age and sex classes. You can say that, well, there's cubs, there's subadult bears, there's male bears, there's female bears as adults. But we can also classify brown bears into uh, different habituation levels, whether they're tolerant of people or intolerant of people. A lot of the brown bears at Brooks River are what could, can be classified as human habituated. That means they're, they basically don't respond to the close proximity of people in a lot of instances. They're used to our presence. So habituation in this sense is a waning response to a neutral stimulus. But there are bears throughout the park and that try to visit Brooks River that are not habituated to the presence of people. And studies from the 1980s and on have, have documented that those non-human, those, those bears that are not habituated to the presence of people are displaced from important areas to feed when people are present. So down around the mouth of the river where this, this photograph was taken, we almost never saw bears that were intolerant to the presence of people. They just completely avoided the area when people were there. So we are at the river impact their, um, their, their distribution and their movements. So that's when we're thinking about the paradox of wildlife viewing. At Brooks River, there are stresses that we put on the wildlife, even unintentionally. Even if we're staying 100 yards from a bear or 50 yards from a bear, at Brooks River. Uh, some bears, that's not far enough. Uh, but when you have, again, 10 to 11,000 people visiting Brooks River, and most of them coming during the month of July because they want to see bears fishing at Brooks Falls, and that's really prime time to see bears visiting at Brooks Falls. It does have a significant impact on the distribution of the animals. Yes, sir? Is there also a positive impact, though, in the sense that those females with young get access to a part of the creek that boars do not want to be around? So there, they actually have more reproductive by having people nearby. Yes, there is that, that aspect of it. Um, we also have, uh, so, so a lot of our most habituated bears at Brooks River um, are, are females that bear offspring frequently. So like this bear right here, number 435 Ollie, she's had a lot of cubs. We, sit, we have a lot of bears that use the mouth of the river, a lot of females that have learned to use the mouth of the river. Um, and that gives them that advantage. Um, I don't think they're doing it to be around us. That's just open habitat that they're not competing with adult males with. So there is that dynamic. It, def it definitely does shift the, uh, again, the, the movement of uh, and distribution of brown bears along the river. Brooks Falls is kind of like a different, a different beast in its own way because uh, people can, when the, when the bears are at Brooks Falls, you're basically restricted to the wildlife feeding platform at Brooks Falls. And that seems to allow some of those brown bears who aren't habituated to the presence of people the ability to kind of get used to us. They'll look up and they'll see us, but they're like, uh, if you stay right there and you don't yell at me, then I will be able to go um, down here and fish. So it is a, a different dynamic up at Brooks Falls. We do see a lot more adult males there. Uh, but some of the studies in the 1980s found that females with cubs who aren't tolerant of people were really at a big disadvantage. Um, so not all females will learn to tolerate the presence of people uh, at the river. So if you're a female with cubs and you, or for whatever reason, maybe it's in your genes, you had a bad experience as a, a young bear around people, whatever it happens to be, if you're a female with cubs, doesn't like people, you're at a big disadvantage because people are everywhere and maybe some of those, those spots that aren't occupied by people are occupied by really big uh, bears that you can't compete with. So again, we, we're, at, at Brooks River, there are um, not only monetary barriers to visiting, but there are, um, you know, physical barriers, it's just a hard place to get to. And then we have, of course, the paradox of wildlife viewing in national parks experience there. So how do we, I think, bridge these barriers? How do we allow people who can't visit this place the opportunity to have a meaningful wildlife viewing experience? 
Should this experience be restricted only to those people who can physically visit? I argue that it shouldn't. Um, and I hope to convince you during the rest of the program that you, we, that you can allow people who can't visit your park the ability to have a meaningful wildlife viewing experience through webcams. Because we identified um, webcams in, oh, let me try to jump start this, sometimes the, uh, doesn't load as quickly. Well, webcams were identified as a, uh, an important interpretive tool uh, during the park's long-range interpretive plan, the last long-range interpretive plan from uh, 2008, I think is when, when we um, implemented that. And I, I have to thank uh, Roy Wood, the chief of, former chief of interpretation at CatMai, for kind of jump-starting this process. He kind of envisioned uh, the ability to give people who can't visit the park sort of like a, a virtual experience. He, liked to, he likes to call it a virtual campfire, uh, allowing people to view the brown bears and then giving the, uh, everyone the ability to, uh, to form a community around, the, around these animals. So we tried an iteration of uh, webcams at Katmai, I think as early as uh, 2009 and 2010, but the, it was kind of like a house run process uh, using the regional office uh, and the, the, the support and for IT wasn't there. Uh, the technology wasn't quite there. The server that we had the webcams hosting at the time only supported about 25 people watching it at once. So there's more than 25 people in the room. And so we could never even log in. We could never see what people were watching. We didn't know what they were talking about. So it, it didn't quite work. Uh, but in 2012, Katmai National Park entered a partnership with explore.org. And Explore.org is really the world's largest sort of um, live streaming nature uh, website. So they have cams all over the world um, and focusing on different, different things. Some of them are at, at farm sites, um, animal sanctuaries, uh, and then they also have uh, live streaming webcams of animals out in the wild doing animal things. And the, uh, the bear cams are their most popular um, webcam. And I, when I started working on the webcams in, in 2013, I really never envisioned how impactful the reach uh, of, of this can, can be and just how large the actual reach is. There are wildlife viewing platforms at Katmai, and that's, again, where a lot of people are going to, uh, around Brooks River, and that's where a lot of the people are going to watch uh, those brown bears physically. They're standing on those wildlife viewing platforms. And we utilize those to mount the webcams on. So there are up to, well, six or more, depending on how much bandwidth is available, to stream um, live footage from Brooks River. So some upstream near Brooks Falls. Uh, and it's important to have cameras up here because that's where brown bears are fishing for salmon in, in July. So that's prime time bear viewing. If you've ever seen a picture of a brown bear catching a salmon at a waterfall, it's taken at Brooks Falls. There's also a... Um, a camera downstream at the Brooklyn's platform, looking upriver towards uh, the falls. And then there are several downstream of, uh, of the falls at the mouth of the river. In late summer and fall, during September and October, that's where a lot of brown bears gather to feed on dead and dying salmon. So the dynamic <coughs> at Brooks River really shifts depending on the time of the year. Bears will go where the food is most easily accessible. And it's not always easily accessible at Brooks Falls. So the mouth of the river offers people really important bear viewing opportunities. Um, and there's also one that's attached to the floating bridge at Brooks River that gives us some underwater footage of salmon and, a, and the occasional bear swimming by. And that one actually is one of my favorites uh, because it gives it gave me a perspective on something that I couldn't see in person. Yes, sir. Question in the back. Do you yes. physically restrict the number of people that can go to each of the platforms? Uh, yes and no. Um, most of the platforms have um, unrestricted access. So the ones at the mouth of the river. Um, as many people as can fit on there will stand on there. Uh, at, at the Riffles platform, that's the case as well. But Brooks Falls is so popular that it's limited to 40 people at a time, basically for space considerations. And that's one of the tougher jobs for the interpreters at Brooks River to do, uh, is to manage that platform. You actually have, when it's really busy, you have little time. Uh, and I did this for a number of years. Um, you, when you're up there, you, you're doing almost no interpretation. You're doing a lot of people management. You're like, you have to an advanced reserve. Right to that. Not, not right now, no. Um, but ideas like that have been thrown around, and, I, and again, I can't really speak for what the park is considering at the moment. But there are no advanced reservations, so it's first come, first serve. 
people are limited to an hour at a time at Brooks Falls when it's at capacity. Um, so that allows us to rotate people through, and you're not limited to an hour a day, just an hour at a time, and only when people are waiting. Mike, can I yes. just one quick question? Sure. So when I, when I look at the map, what I see is just bears with nothing. Can you talk just very briefly about how an area like this manages that interaction without having them come kind of face to face in a negative way where you get uh, Well, they come face to face all the time. So there, there's no, there really is, with the, the sheer number of bears and the sheer number of people, there is no way for us to physically separate people from bears at appropriate distances at all times. Rangers, um, at we are at the mouth of the river um, during uh, the daytime hours. So we have a ranger stationed um, at what we call the corner right here. And we also have one at the uh, wildlife viewing platform to manage people going across the bridge. Because you're not allowed, I can't, my regulation prohibits you from approaching a bear within 50 yards. So you cannot approach a bear within 50 yards. Um, so if a bear's within 50 yards of the bridge, we shut it down. Or, um, say, hey, that's closed. We wait, generally wait for the bear to move on. Um, and then open up the bridge for people to go through. When people are walking the trail to Brooks Falls, they're mostly on their own. Um, and that's, the Brooks Falls Trail actually is an area with uh, a, a quite a high number of close encounters between people. People, I should back up and say, when everyone arrives, they get to the visitor center and they go through a mandatory orientation. This is a 20 minute orientation, it's a video and a talk that lays down the expectations and the rules about visiting Brooks River. So that sets most people up for success. And then we also have a lot of staff roaming around. Um, two to three bear technicians roaming the Brooks Lodge area. This is a high area of bear and human conflict. So bears are moving through here all the time. You can see uh, how the river wraps around right here. So bears want to use this peninsula all the time. This You can't develop, you can't design better bear habitat than where Brooks Lodge is. <laughs> it's, it would be impossible. It gives them everything they need. It gives them everything but a denning site. And then if they want to go to the dens, they just go up to Dumpling. <laughs> Not all of them do, but many of them will just go up to Dumpling Mountain. So it's a very challenging um, area to, to be a, a ranger at. It's very intense. It can be very stressful. Uh, when, you, when you're out there, you're dealing with, with brown bears, sometimes within feet of you. Uh, luckily, the brown bears have a fairly high tolerance for the presence of people in, in most cases. And also, their reaction distance is different than uh, Yellowstone grizzly or Denali grizzly. So uh, those bears, you want to keep a greater distance from than a, than a Katmai bear as a general rule of thumb. Uh, but our bears here at Brooks River generally are fairly tolerant to the close, close proximity of people. Um, and also food is a big, uh, food are, uh, is restricted. You cannot eat food outside of a building, except in like two, pic three picnic areas. The campground and two, and two picnic areas. So and that's to prevent bears from ever learning that we have food available to us. You're welcome. Yes? So I've never had an accident. Um, but I yes. can't believe all these bears and people come and face to face. It's, it's, it. it's remarkable. Uh, <laughs> if I could describe it in one word. Um, I... You see, the, you see people doing things that you just shake your head at. And the, what, what the bears let people get away with is, is amazing in some instances. Uh, there have been, um, bears have injured people at Brooks Camp before, but they're uh, extremely rare. Uh, there was a, the most serious incident happened in the 1960s. And at that time, there weren't as many bears at Brooks River. Um, and there weren't restrictions on where you could eat your food what, and food storage. So uh, the a person was bitten in the middle of the night in the campground, and he had uh, food odors around him, and that was acceptable at the time. Um, he had um, trout, he had his cooking utensils and things like that near, nearby. He slept under the stars because it was a nice night. Um, so that was kind of just the thing that people did at, at the time. The other two instances happened in the 1990s um, on the Brooks Falls Trail, and this is a place with very limited visibility. Um, so when you walk, it's easy to get surprised on the Brooks Falls Trail because you can't see very far uh, into the forest. So um, those were, uh, one was a, an instance, I think, where uh, a child was run over by a bear. There were bears chasing each other on the trail, and the kid was run over. Um, he had some bruises, and that was it. So, um, and then the other one happened to a ranger up near the, um, uh, the uh, previous iteration of the falls platform. Uh, she was charged by a bear and had some injuries to her hands. So, yes, ma'am. To bring the conversation back to webcams, then are those playing in the visitor center so that people that 
if there's too much use already on the viewing platforms, they're still able to experience it there? Uh, yes, yes, they are playing in the visitor center when we can get the technology to work. Um, so, so that's actually a, an extremely important interpretive tool that I, I utilized when I worked in the visitor center. When people are going in there and they're waiting for their bear orientation, we have the cam, the Brooks Falls cam or the Lower River cam streaming at that moment, and you can get people immediately thinking about the brown bears that they're going to see, uh, talk about their behavior, their biology, so that immediately gets them engaged. And sometimes there's bears on the beach or right outside of the visitor center too, so that you know hooks people in um, immediately. And then when people are waiting for their plane to leave, um, most people land by a uh, float plane down near the visitor center. When they're waiting to leave, they'll go into the visitor center and they're kind of killing time for 10 minutes. They'll end up watching the webcams in there, and that's also a more remarkable interpretive opportunity. So if you have a webcam at your site, definitely, and you have a visitor center, stream it right inside. Get people, uh, that's a, a, a very effective way to interpret to the audience that's, that's at your site. You can describe the technology. Uh, I can, yes, yes. And in fact, um, the, uh, the webcams are fairly inconspicuous. That kind of leads into maybe um, this slide here. Uh, the, the webcams are fairly inconspicuous. So they're mostly mounted on existing um, infrastructure. So right on the wildlife viewing platform. These are basically kind of like security cameras. Um, so they can pan, they can shift, they can zoom in. Um, they're behind these trees are uh, uh, parts of the platform that have box storage boxes that uh, the, the cams are powered by uh, methanol uh, uh, fuel cells and, and solar power. Um, so they're not wind generated at Brooks River. And then the signal itself is sent up on top of Dumpling Mountain and then relayed to King Salmon, where the park headquarters is, where it can get tied into the actual internet. That's an RF signal? Um, microwave. It's a, yeah, it's a microwave signal that's sent, that's sent across. Um, Where's the antenna? So it's um, right behind where these people are standing. It's actually not that small. It's only a dish about you know as big as my torso. And then up on Dublin Mountain, uh, there's a repeater there that catches that signal and then sends it sends it down to King Sound. So they're fairly inconspicuous. Uh, they're not something that necessarily impacts the, the the bear viewing experience for people that are there. And. The, the numbers on the, uh, for, for viewership on the webcams is exceptionally large. So 13 million views per year on Explore.org over the past uh, uh, three years, 6.6 .6 million unique page views. And then when you um, combine all of the places where the webcam feed is embedded, because sometimes it gets picked up by like New, uh, Newsweek or CNN for just a little bit, and they'll be like, hey, watch Bears at Brooks Falls. Um, over, 30 minute, or, or over 30 million views per year. Uh, on average, and then uh, in total, that's 5.7 million hours streamed. I think that's equivalent to like 654 years of bear watching. <laughs> I did the math on that. So, and a lot of people are watching uh, bears for a, for a long periods of time, um, and it's viewed in all 50 states and almost every country in the world. I think there's just a, like two or three countries where we didn't have at least one hit. And I have to say, there's you know a little bit of a you know, this number can be a little bit misleading. It is almost every country in the world, but some countries have like one hit. So I like to brag about that, but again, you know, uh, some, some countries were not reaching as much as like the United States. The vast majority of people that are viewing the webcams are viewing it in the United States. Yes? So is it your, your webcam program um, managed through Explore.org? How, how do they work and how do they tell you to for example, we have an Okay. So Explore.org um, provides us, or pro provides, I shouldn't say us, because again, I don't work for Katmai anymore, uh, pro provides Katmai National Park um, with some exceptional uh, technolo technology expertise. Um, so they will send technicians out to set these the cameras up um, for us. And they do this for all the sites that they host. Um, so they'll send, they, they send out technicians that can, that can work with us. Um, they uh, also were, um, are, are gracious enough 
to um, buy the hardware so we can do live stream programs too. I want to. I do want to talk about towards the end of the program how if you can't like afford you know something like this, there are ways to interpret to an online audience. There are tools that are existing and they're free right now that you can utilize. So I do want to. I do want to touch base on that. But Explore.org provides Cat with with a lot of that that expertise. I know you guys. Yes, um, so the, um, I'm going to exit the program here. Let me look that up for you because I had that. So the cost, cost to install the cams, um, you know, uh, several thousand dollars per camera. Um, and then installation for off-grid features, four to seven thousand dollars. So it can seem, you know, kind of expensive. But when you're thinking about the reach that this gets, the bang for the buck is, is worth it. Um, you have to invest you know, maybe several thousand dollars at the, at the beginning to get this stuff to work. Um, and I have the contact information for the technicians um, exported, that are exported work contracts. So if you want me to give their, their, their contact information afterwards, I'll be happy to, take it, to do that. Yes, sir. Real quick, relative to that, uh, considering the cost to get to Cat Mine, as you illustrated a little earlier, does that increase it could be it could be yeah because you have to ship things up and like the the fuel cells that's hazardous cargo that must come um, something like if, um, if you can't if you don't get get it to the barge and plan like a month ahead for it to be shipped around the Alaska Peninsula and land in Naknek and pick it up at the barge you have to fly it in as hazardous cargo and that's exceptionally expensive so it can be cheaper for a place that has road access for, for sure <laughs> so huge numbers and for a long time you know on the webcams I was getting a lot of comments that uh, had me you know realizing that this is you know impacting a lot of people uh, people would often say to me um, the bear cams changed my life uh, they inspired me to become a national park ranger And, I want, and they uh, also help people to get through chemotherapy. We saw comments like this. I want to thank you. I, I, I can't thank you enough as it got me through my chemotherapy. I couldn't have gone through it without it. I pretty much got to watch uh, brown bears each day and was entertained for hours each day. I went back to the chemo ward to let others know about this. And now there's a whole group of chemo patients talking about brown bears at Katmai National Park. And then we also got some, somewhat humorous comments. The playground monitor brought in two of my boys from recess, recess for biting. No one was really hurt, but evidently they were playing Brooks Falls. One of them was Otis and one of them was Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and and I didn't, the teacher originally said, I didn't think it was very funny. Someone replied, I think it's funny. And I thought it was very funny, too. And she said, afterwards, I, I thought it was funny, too. And they were really pretending. They went as far to tell the AP that Otis always has his spot and Ted shouldn't have moved in. So those kids, were, those kids were paying attention. So we see the, I, I, you know, we would see comments like this all the time during the first few summers of the existence of Bear Camp. And I was really curious about, um, are, are these anecdotes, or are this really kind of reflective of the, of the Bear Camp audience as a whole? And yes, question? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, you know, banter like this is good, but then wondering what control we would have as a federal agency to, you know, who's, Who's responding to these comments, and can we then respond to these comments? Or, you know, just being in charge of the messaging that's going in and out from a, a cam that we would have linked to this. So, if you can explain. Yes, yes, and that. I will. Yeah, yeah, keep that thought in mind because um, okay. I will cover those um, in just a little bit. So, so excellent point. Um, there, there, uh, people can add their opinions on the bear cams basically wherever, but rangers are actually very, very involved. In the messaging associated with um, with, how, with the bear cam viewing experience, um, so I think that's a, a, a staff play an extremely important role in making this a meaningful experience. So it's just not like random people always giving random opinions. Um, park staff are on the webcams quite frequently, and we'll talk about that in, in just a little bit. So I was again very curious to know whether or not this was a uh, these anecdotes were a, a reflection of. 
you know, uh, just a few people that I saw from time to time on the webcams, or if it was actually um, a reflection of the BearCam audience as a whole. So in 2016, um, some researchers from Kansas State University, uh, Ryan Sharp, Jeffrey Skivens, and Julie Sharp were able to come to Catline National Park and do a survey to compare the on-site uh, on experience and the, the webcam experience. So they uh, surveyed 235 people at Brooks River. Um, they distributed the survey online on Explore.org, and they got 5,628 respondents. So they had a, a quite a large sample size for the online respondents. Um, and then there's a percent response on the, uh, this side of the graph. So similar um, in the sense of how many people visited Katmai before, very, very few. On-site visitors, only 16% had been to Katmai National Park before. Only 7% of the online audience. So the online audience is generally an audience that's never been to the park. Uh, the gender ratio was actually very different. Um, and this is kind of interesting. I would like someone to perhaps study this in the future. Why? Um, you know, we have, you know, 49% um, male uh, visitors at Katmai um, on site, but only 29% filled out the survey. Is it only that, you know, maybe women are more likely to fill out surveys for, for bears? Um, or is there something else to it? I don't, I don't know. But I would like that um, to have more information on that in the future, because that's a, that's a stark difference uh, between the online viewers and the on site viewers. And then income levels. Um, Again, from this is kind of on par with previous on, on uh, visitor surveys that got my 48% of people reported an income, household income over $100,000. Only 21% of webcam viewers reported a household income that high. Uh, the, oops, clicked one too many times here. We like to see pictures of cute bears once in a while, so I have to throw them in. Um, and on-site visitors at at um, at Katmai spent quite a bit of time. On-site visitors at Katmai spent quite a bit of time watching brown bears during their visit. They spent three days visiting. They they uh, they they spent about nine hours watching brown bears at, at Brooks River. And that actually that's that seems low, surprisingly low to me. I took a trip, just a personal trip up the Brooks River, and I'm the, I'm the brown bear junkie, so I spent almost all of my waking hours trying to watch brown bears. So my, I spent way over nine hours in, in just like a day and a half when I, when I was there. Uh, but people were spending uh, quite, a, quite a bit of time when they're at Brooks River watching brown bears, but the online audience spends a, quite a bit more watching brown bears. Because their, their experience isn't limited just to like going to the falls and then leaving. Their experience can be extended day after day after day. So online visitors, on average, spent 85 minutes per visit to explore.org. And 79% watched at least once a day during the peak season. So these, uh, the people who are watching the, the webcams are getting a, an experience that extends over days, weeks, months, and years. And this really does give us an opportunity uh, to to provide them with very in-depth con content over, over time. Yes, Amanda. Um, some of these studies, did they look at, are they like the only thing they're doing online is just watching the webcams, or is it like in the background of their day? Yeah. Like are they at their desk working? They didn't, they didn't ask that question, okay. so we don't know. I know people do that, for sure. I mean, we yeah. see comments like that that happen, so I know yeah. that that's the case. Um, some people leave it streaming all the time. Um, so they'll, they'll have it like on their TV in their living room, and then on the computer in their kitchen, or whatever. So the results could be skewed there. There could be a little bit of, um, uh, yeah, there could, there could be some errors in, in that sense. I don't know if that's an accurate way to describe the statistic. But I don't know if it invalidates yeah. it. I mean, either way, it's part of their day. Yeah. But, yeah. So it, um, again, yeah, a lot of the, I think the main point to consider is that people are watching at least once a day. They're tuning in. They're going. They're having a, a wildlife viewing experience from Katmai at least once a day. But how does this really translate to wildlife conservation? Uh, is, is the webcam experience or is just like a novel thing? Oh yeah, that's cool, and I like bears, I like this bear. Um, but is it is it provoking people to care more about wild animals? And the survey also asked those questions. So comparing the brown bear viewing experience between on-site visitors and online visitors, they found that the brown bear viewing experience was, um, online is on par 
with an on-site visit. So the bears I saw today increased my connection to the species. Do you disagree with that or strongly agree with that? And most people have fairly high opinions of that, yes. It does increase my connection to the species. Does it increase support for parks and protected areas? Yes, it does. And in fact, the online audience, that, um, that number exceeds the on-site visitors. Does it increase the understanding of the US NPS role and in preservation? Yes, so most people agree um, with that. Increased interest in wildlife conservation, also very high numbers for that. And increased interest in visiting other national parks. So this, again, the fairly equivalent uh, results from the people who are at Brooks River and the people who are, are just watching on the cams. But what about conservation? Um, it's, it, again, it, that was like part of the experience. The experience seems to be meaningful for, for people, according to the survey. Well, what about hypothetical uh, conservation actions? What if we ask the audience, hey, will you be supportive of further protections for brown bears? And this, you can see that the online audience, uh, their support for these hypothetical actions exceeds those for people who are on site. So support for limiting recreation if it is a positive impact for brown bears. The online audience, again, responded, at, agreed, to, with, agreed to that at higher levels versus the online, uh, or excuse me, the on-site audience. Support limiting viewing locations if it's a positive impact for brown bears. They also, the online audience also uh, was more likely to agree with that. Support limiting access if it has a positive impact for brown bears. Again, similar results. And then, would you forego a visit if it has a positive impact on brown bears? And they use, these are kind of questions that, um, that staff at Katmai, including myself, when we were talking with the researchers about the survey, I wanted to throw these in there. Because for decades, Brooks River has grappled with um, crowding issues. Um, again, going back to that um, paradox of wildlife viewing in national parks, Brooks River is at capacity right now. 11,000 people is a lot for that spot. And if we, we tried to, uh, if, if the, uh, if 2,000, 3,000 more people went to Brooks River, Anella, Landis, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> that would be a lot of people uh, to, to visit this space. So um, these are hypothetical um, situations. Again, um, it might be different if we actually said, hey, Everyone on this side of the room can go visit brown bears, but all of you can't. You have to forego your visit because that's too many people. You might get different numbers, but these are measuring people's hypothetical support for these actions. Uh, so it does seem that the webcams so far do seem to generate that. that. Yes, sir, in the back, and then I'll get the question. I'm a little confused by the statement here. Um, when you say positive impact, you mean that it increases their positively impacts, or do you mean that it's a negative impact, really? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, um, yeah, so a uh, positive impact for brown bears. Um, I, the, I, the idea behind this question, like support limiting access if it has a positive impact for brown bears, that I was measuring a, uh, let me try to try to phrase it just a little like bit if differently. You, if you don't go, it'll be better yeah. for bears. Yeah, you could say that yes, it has an impact, so that's positive. Not oh, okay. for the bear. Okay, yeah. But or it could be a negative impact on the bear. So which is it? So yeah, it's a um, um, limiting access. This would have a positive impact on brown bears. So. So yes. Yeah. So like, if there's less people, again, kind of going back to the research we know about how people influence the behavior of brown bears at Brooks River. If people, um, if there were less people at Brooks River, we, we would probably see the distribution of brown bears be different. Um, a, a more natural, um, or at least um, less altered, and less human influenced population of brown bears at, at Brooks River. So I hope that answers your well, question or clears yeah, up some of the questions. I think if you look at all the questions, uh, maybe I'm reading wrong because I'm so far away, but it just, it's a little that I could answer in either way. Okay. I could say yes, it has a negative impact, or no, it has a positive. Or yes, it has a positive. Impact. So I guess that. You know. well, okay. 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 Yeah. I, no. Um, yeah. So, um, so the 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 intention was that that these would have a positive impact. So, um, or the question kind of implied that. Okay. So, supporting 
limiting viewing locations would have a positive impact okay. on the universe. Yeah, yeah. So that that was kind of the the uh, uh, the, the I guess the uh, the premise of the question. Yeah. So these things would have a positive impact if if managers took took action in that, in that sense. All right. Yes. Okay. You're welcome. Yes, sir. And you had a, a question. Yeah. yeah. The chart study. Um, I can't remember if that question. I can look up uh, the, um, the the report. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, that's one of the cautionary notes that I think I'll, I'll try to recap towards the end. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, if your webcam's popular, it can drive visitation towards your park. So that's uh, as part of a long uh, long term management plan for your site or whatever. Think about that. So if you're facing, you know, challenges as far as like crowding, then that, that's definitely something to, to consider. And that's actually exactly where I was going with this when we get criticism saying, why would you want to drive a feature in a site that's already too busy to crowd it beyond its capacity? Sure. Why would sure. You, I understand that argument as well. Yeah, and I, I um I've always emphasized that of you know, people do bring that up once in a while. Um, Hey, this, the webcams are just going to make Brooks River more crowded. It's going to be even worse. It's going to be more crowded. The, the viewing experience is going to decline. But I, I will counter that argument and say, yeah, that's a potential impact for the people visiting the, the site. But the webcams aren't for the people who can visit. They're really for the people who can't visit. Um, so I think that's really their, their greatest and highest value. Um, and the webcam audience is also extremely engaged. And getting to... Um, to some of the, the, the ways that, that Rangers at Catline have interpreted and, and still interpret to the online audience, they're not just watching, they're actively engaged in what we're actually doing. So um, of those online respondents, um, 5,600 of them, over half participated in the, the live chats that Rangers do. So that's a huge number. 50% of the audience, at least the ones that responded, say so yeah, and that might not be, that might not correspond to 30 million views each year, uh, but this is half of the yearly visitation at Brooks Camp. So if you can do an online program that is equal to equivalent of one half of your park site, wouldn't you take that deal? I think so. And uh, comments, they participate in comments, embedded commenting features, um, over a quarter of them. They're very involved on Facebook. Um, and then um, the, the fourth largest bit of participation that the online audience did was a blog. Um, the, 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 the survey also asked how many of the on-site people watched the webcams, and uh, about 50% of the on-site visitors that they surveyed at Brooks River watched the webcam. So people were watching it before they got there, which is also really an incredible way that you can reach, uh, reach people and start to get your messages out before they get there. And I do really want to, um, you know, over the next, um, you know, 20, 20 minutes before uh, the, the, the program concludes, talk about how we can interpret to that online audience. I brought up a lot of stats. I talked about Brooks River and its dynamics. But uh, based on these statistics, I think it is worthwhile for every national park, every nature center, to try to take the leap into online interpretation. And I'm going to put a pun in there. Take the leap, because it is. <laughs> It's extremely effective, and rangers at, at, at Katmai National Park will uh, er, 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 do uh, make great efforts to make the online viewing experience a meaningful one. It's just not that people get to see this stuff, but they get to talk to rangers and interact with them and learn more about the brown bears that they think are very special. And I want to define a term for everybody. I want to I want to <coughs> define this term. Because a lot of times you end up reading what national parks do online is social media. We do social media. We post things on Facebook. We post things on Twitter. I want to say that we don't do that anymore. What we do is online interpretation. So shift your mindset a little bit. Try to think about the visitors that are online um, as, as important as the people who are physically visiting your site. And I define online interpretation as the methods and philosophy of heritage interpretation extended to audiences over the internet. And we need to do that, I think, through webcams and through these social media platforms that almost every national park and nature center is using. There's a variety of different ways that we interpret to the online audience at Brooks River. Before I get to those, though, um, more about this sort of like online um, audience. And interpreting to them has a lot of similarities with 
interpreting uh, to a physical visitor. So you want to be, uh, your interpretive purpose remains the same. You're still trying to give people a meaningful experience. You want to use engaging techniques that capture the attention of the audience, and you want to meet the audience's interests. So those things are, are basically the same, but there are some big differences too, and I think these are great advantages versus uh, interpreting to an on-site visitor who can go to your ranger talk and, hey, stick around for a half hour and then leave and maybe ne never interact with another ranger again. But when you're interpreting to an online audience, they can come back for more. It's very easy for them to do that. So you can develop a continuous, long-term conversation with your audience. You can develop an established trust and rapport with your audience. Ranger Roy gets online, Ranger Landis gets online, Ranger Anella gets online. People know that they know their stuff. And uh, a lot of the, again, a lot of the webcam audience returns frequently. So they know to trust Ranger Landis and Ranger Anella when they get online. You can engage on-site visitors before and after they visit. So this is a way to extend that experience to people who aren't, you know, just at your site. They come to your site, tell them about the webcam. They go home, they start watching brown bears. They learn more about Katmai. They have a, a maybe that makes their experience at the site more meaningful. There's a, of course a potential for a world, worldwide audience, so you're maybe reaching demographics that you wouldn't otherwise. And this one I think is also really important. Anything that you do online stays there forever, so you don't want to mess up. But at the same time, it's a recorded um, repository of knowledge, so if people can look back at what you did. They can go back to the Ranger chats. They can look at the blog posts. They can they can search these things uh, and 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 gain more insight into uh, the uh, into the resources that they're watching on on the cameras. One of the ways that rangers reach people at Brooks River is through live ranger chats. So we um, using a wireless signal we tie into the bear cams. Our park partner Explorer or um, uh, basically switches over the feed like they're doing right now, so I'm live on the bear cam right now, and the, uh, the park partners at Explore.org uh, stream us live. Um, so live ranger chats are one of these, uh, I think, really important ways to, to engage the audience um, and give them a, a more meaningful experience. We generally, in our more classic live chats, we generally had like a topic that we would discuss. So and it was based on the time of the year, what was going on at Brooks River. We don't really want to talk about something that's, you know, kind of far flung, not going to capture the attention of the audience. So when bears are fishing at Brooks Falls, we might talk about the dominance um, uh, interactions between brown bears or the hierarchy that, uh, between brown bears, helping people to sort of understand what they're seeing. And then the latter half of these chats usually are question and answer. So we're getting audience questions live um, and we're reading those and uh, most of the time, we didn't know what we were getting asked. So it was very impromptu, um, thinking, on, thinking on our feet. Uh, but this was a, one of our more classic examples of how we engaged uh, the online audience. So live chats, face-to-face, -face, um, and then also taking people into the river itself. If you have the ability, find the stranger in the room, everybody. He's here. <laughs> I've got a haircut. <laughs> So, <laughs> so yeah, afterwards you can see Cam about his uh, his minding there. We have audio for this, but I turned it down. For the Thank you. We do, yeah. So we advertise this on on Facebook, through Twitter, um, Explore.org will advertise it with us. The webcam audience advertises it with us because they get very excited for these things. We put it on our website uh, too. The, the, you know, the calendar feature for, for NPS.gov on your websites is uh, kind of a little clunky to work with. So we tried to get it up on there when we could, but it didn't, didn't always happen. But usually through social media uh, channels is where we were advertising these. Uh, so yeah, trying to get people into places where they wouldn't be able to physically visit most of the time. So going into the water, talking about how brown bears fish at Brooks River. So this is uh, one of the most fun live chats, I think, that I ever did. Getting in Brooks River, I'm holding the camera right now, Landis is in, in the water, so we did a little bit of swimming here to show people what it's like to be at Brooks Falls. Another um, way that uh, you can interpret to an online audience is just by getting on camera and describing what people are seeing. So this is um, the, the setup here, the camera setup for streaming live is covered with a bag to protect it from the inevitable drizzle <laughs> and rain that comes through the Alaska Peninsula. But this is uh, what we call a play-by-play. 
And it's like a sporting event. Uh, a ranger's on camera, and we're describing what we're seeing in the moment. Uh, this takes, you know, this is, this is very much on the fly. It's, it's kind of like informal interpretation. You are describing what you're seeing on camera. So utilizing, like, these scenes, a bear trying to steal fish from another bear to highlight those meanings that people maybe recognize. Uh, the competition and conflict that these bears go through. The struggle for survival. The hunger that they face. I mean, these, these moments, these are extremely engaging interpretive moments. So if you do have animals on your webcams, and you can go live and just kind of describe what those animals are doing, that's, these are, again, very effective ways uh, to, to bring meaning out uh, for those people who may not understand what's going on. They may not know that this is a hungry adult male and that, that other one's a female. They may not know what's going on. So again, bring those things to life. Um, I'm not much of a football fan, but if I do watch football, I kind of like hearing the commentary because I don't know too much about football. So it helps me to understand the game. Um, and, the uh, you know, again, a play-by-play -play with animals can help the online audience. Uh, in the same way. Yes, and these are also, um, for the most part, uh, streamed on um, and, and posted on Explorador's YouTube channel. Uh, so people can watch those, um, I, uh, again, if they want to. Yes? So I've been thinking about this uh, pretty much the whole presentation of this technology is going to become obsolete. And where we're kind of leaning towards is drone activity and covering over the animals that way and getting live streaming from that activity. And right now, our policy in the Park Service is no drones. And um, I work in Grand Teton, so we've had a, it's starting to become a habitual problem where you have people with drones who are, because the pop, now the technology is becoming affordable and people have it on their own, like to come in and, and get good views on some of the bears that are already habituated to people. So do you, and this is a problem I have, you know, with park services, sometimes we try to say that we are progressive, but sometimes our sure. regulations are not adhering to where the technology is going. So do you see, um, or what is your opinion on drone activity in the park service, and especially making these stationary webcams be more in those isolated areas in your park, especially in the, the valleys that most people go to? Sure, sure, and I think, um, I personally, I would say keep them to impacted areas. Um, there's there's a, a lot of people go throughout Katma to watch brown bears. So I would never really want, there are a few places, a few pockets of areas where where people don't go. And I wouldn't want necessarily to encourage people to go see that, that brown bear that they have a connection with at that spot. One of the things that I want to talk about before um, the session is over is that people do connect very strongly with the individual animals. So that's, that would be a, um, a, a potential issue with a place that people aren't visiting. So as far as, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think the, as the technology improves, we're just going to have to play with it, see what works, works what, what is, not only what works, but what is ethical mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, a drone flying over Brooks Falls would have a pretty significant impact on the brown bears and on uh, the, the viewing experience for the people there, too. So, so I think as technology improves, we'll have to just answer the, those questions carefully. Um, that's a, 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 a good philosophical debate, I think, that have had in the future. Yes, sir. Isn't it also true, though, that if you're fundamentally held by different things, the growth to the fixed food source, dependable year after year, so your camera angle being low is critical to get the animal, you know, jaws opening, fish entering. The drone can never really get that. It's always an above angle shot. It has to be at some height. Yes. Yeah. They, there, there are dynamics that are quite different between between the two places. Um, and I let's see. Uh, I'd like to discuss that more. I'm running a little short on time, though. so maybe afterwards I'd be happy to try to chat with you a little bit about that. Uh, we often, in interpretation, we often talk about whether we're inflicting uh, our cell phone audiences. And with the bear cam, people don't want to listen to you. They don't have to listen. They just turn it down. 
So you're not inflicting yourself really on any, anybody. We never re really reached a saturation point, I think, for online programs. As uh, at Brooks River, uh, if we were lucky, two or three times a week, we could, we could do an online program with all of the other stuff that we were trying to juggle at the same time. There's demand, I think, for at least two programs a day on the bear camps because the audience is so large. Um, we never kind of reached that saturation point, but again, you're not necessarily inflicting yourself on the online audience. Um, blog, blog posts are another important way that we reach the audience, try to get messages out. These are, again, written repositories of knowledge. That, uh, this allows people to um, read back on events that happened in the past. We tried to write about current events. So if you have the ability to blog, do it. Um, tie it to your webcams. We blog on Katmai's website. We, um, Katmai National Park still does that. I still blog on explore.org from time to time, writing about um, Bears and the dynamic. And then one of the other really important things is um, an embedded comment feature on explore.org. And this is actually what's happening now. Um, we're not going to be able to scroll down and see what's, what's happening below. But this is um, the embedded comment, commenting feature on explore.org. So somebody was asking earlier, how do we, you know, what sort of messaging are we getting uh, to people? Um, the embedded commenting feature is live. We can we can chat right in the comments, right with them. And this really helps to develop sort of like that virtual campfire experience. Being able to sit down as a group, as a community, and, and talk about the wildlife that we're seeing, sharing screenshots, um, like people share their photographs of Brooks River. This embedded commenting feature allows that. So uh, if that's another very important way to reach online audiences. And it's just not kind of going in and, and answering people's questions, but maybe also prompting them too with, um, with information about um, the bears themselves. Going in uh, ahead of time, writing something, at, um, getting online, posting that, having people discuss. So uh, essential questions, I think, uh, you've heard that term being thrown around and how interpretation might be shifting more in that direction. Some people think that you, know, you can use essential questions instead of themes or with along themes. Comments in, um, like, uh, in these, uh, these platforms you can ask those questions if you think that's an appropriate way to interpret it. And then embrace the individual. I can't emphasize this enough. At Brooks River, bears are identified by number and some of them acquire nicknames. And I know a lot of people have issues with identifying animals with nicknames. But your audience is going to do it. You're not going to win that battle. So I emphasize that you kind of control that information Give them some way to identify the animal, whether it's a name or a number, maybe it doesn't really matter. But people will latch on to individual animals. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because you can utilize these animals to highlight the larger bear world. This is probably the most famous bear on the internet. So this is number 480 Otis. People love this bear. And, and I don't blame him. Uh, he's at the falls a lot. People can connect with him. In fact, you know, just for example, you want to know why? One of the reasons I like Otis so much, he got a good work ethic. He shows up for work every day, nose to the grindstone, productive, focused, gets along with his coworkers, and minds his own beeswax. <laughs> so they're relating their own experience to this individual animal. So embrace the individual. We give people tools that allow them to identify the animals on Brooks River. Uh, because they're seeing cubs, they're seeing mothers, they're seeing bears that have been there for 30 years. They get to watch these bears throughout their whole entire lives, practically. Uh, so the, the Bears of Brooks River ebook is downloaded uh, about 10,000 times per year. And this isn't just like a little site bulletin. It's a 110 megabyte download. So this is a big book. It's, it's 100 pages long. But it's downloaded by a lot of people. And that allows them to connect with these individual animals. And again, link that to the important concepts that you want to that you want to share about brown bear biology and behavior and, the, um, and, and their lives. Social media events can also be uh, very important in that sense. So pairing bears up in the fall during our fat bear week, having people vote on the fattest bear, and bear cam audience, I'm going to call you out because 747 is the largest bear I've ever seen, the fattest bear I've ever seen, and he still didn't win. Otis won. So. <laughs> But we know how elections go sometimes. Uh, 
So this is, this is um, again, this, the, the level of engagement during our Fat Bear Week was exceptionally high. It reached um, on Facebook over 500,000 people, and it had about a 20% engagement rate. So think about that for your Facebook posts. You don't normally get an engagement rate that high, uh, but all of our posts averaged about 20% engagement rate. So that's extremely, extremely high for Fat Bear Week. But you're not always interpreting fun things to watch. You're also interpreting, and you gotta be prepared for those moments where it's unpleasant, where bears die on camera, wildlife dies on camera. And this happened to us in 2015. Um, I casually shared this screenshot of a, of a family uh, on Facebook, uh, on the on the park website, because people like to watch cubs. I was like, oh, cool, cubs, family wrestling. I'm going to share this. Watch the cams. And only later did I realize that this cub was dying on the camera. So I just told everybody to go watch this amazing event. Um, so this was what um, we called an interpretive emergency. You kind of had to drop what you were doing, get online, and help explain to people what was going on. Uh, this, yeah, I can't... Uh, if you have wildlife, you've got to be prepared for those events where people are going to experience the unpleasant. Interpret the bear world, the hard lives that they lead, the struggles that they face, the fact that these animals receive no veterinary care, um, that we're not going to interfere. And this meant thousands of people would watch this bear cub die, and they did. We tried to interpret to the audience, um, and this is what people saw before I happened to realize what was going on, this bear cub stumbling. And eventually, it ends up falling. It's walking. It walks drunkenly towards uh, the um, towards its mother, and it falls down, and it doesn't get up anymore. So we realized fairly uh, quickly that we needed to get online because people were seeing this maybe for the first time. There's always new people tuning into your webcams, so they didn't know anything about Katmai. Many of them, they were very concerned about that that cub's welfare. There was even one person from Switzerland that called the Alaska State Troopers in King Sam, looking to help this animal. Um, so we developed um, frequently asked questions, posted that in the chat. Um, we were on in the comments as much as possible. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get online and do a, a live chat um, because we weren't at, at Brooks Camp or, or, um, or King Salmon at our headquarters at the time. But get online, interpret to the audience, let everybody know that you're with them. You're watching this experience. Tell them what you know. Tell them what you don't know. I think transparency in this situation was extremely important. Yes. And so yeah. how are you coordinating with this with Explore.org so you know who's going to respond? Um, so Explore.org has moderators that are in the, in the chat, but they're not interpreters. The, the, the rangers for Katmai take the lead role in interpreting all of the events that happen at, at Brooks River. So that's kind of like the, uh, it's an unwritten agreement. Um, there's nothing formal that says it has to be that way, but the, the staff at Katmai National Park are supposed to be the leads um, in interpreting uh, online. Um, and then blog posts as well. Post it, following up after the whole situation kind of concluded, following up a blog post to let people know about this situation, and really trying to leverage um, people's um, real need to help. They wanted to help this animal. So we didn't really um, have many options. We're not gonna, we weren't going to have people go to Brooks River and provide veterinary care. So having the camera, if they're going to watch the animal, have them count respirations. I think that was one of the things that we had people do because we didn't know what was wrong with the cub. We found out afterwards that it died from um, canine adenovirus type 1. But at the time, we had no idea. And I actually expected the cub just to get up and walk away because bears are so tough. And that didn't happen. That was another instance where bears proved me wrong. And there are several famous instances of that. Um, but yeah, following up afterwards, giving people an opportunity to try to help in any way that they can, because they will connect with these animals very, very quickly. And it's important that you um, that you leverage that. And then another way to um, interpret individual animals is that you get to follow these animals throughout their whole entire lives. Um, as long as the webcams are live. And seeing very unique events, like the adoption of, uh, of this bear, number four, uh, 503 by this adult female, number uh, 435 Holly. Adoption in brown bears happens, but it's very, very rare. I never saw it at Brooks River until this event. And webcam fans were able to, and viewers were able to see almost like the complete saga of this young bear. Him looking like a, uh, 
a small, pathetic, abandoned yearling on his own, and he overcame the odds. He ended up finding a tolerant bear that protected him. He's now one of the biggest four-and-a-half-year-old bears, coming up on five-year-old bears that I've ever seen. So he beat the odds. His story of survival, I think, will be a very powerful one to continue into the future. So again, utilize those stories of those individual animals that you have at your park to interpret the larger bear world. Because if you want to connect one meaning to bears, survival is one of those easy ones. And so it's really easy to get people to think about survival um, when you talk, when you use this bear's story. A few cautionary notes before I conclude the program here. Webcam popularity may lead to higher visitation. So again, management considerations long term, think about that. Increased notoriety inc creates increased demand for information. So you're going to want to you're going to want to think about that. How am I going to provide information? How transparent am I going to be? How often am I going to be able to provide information? Popular webcams demand full-time attention. This is not a part-time job. You have a, a webcam, think about staffing that full-time. I think the ideal staffing for the Brooks Falls webcams and, uh, would be three people. So anybody in the future thinking about that, uh, you do need a full-time uh, attention to this. And then webcam viewers are people too. Uh, it's commonly perceived that the online viewing experience is inferior to an on-site visit. Um, but we're finding um, that it's not. <sighs> Treat the online viewers like you would an on-site visitor. And focus on people's need to help in a productive way. So when things take a turn for the worse, and there are bears um, maybe dying on the camera, focus people's need to help in a productive way. Think about how you might be able to do that uh, before it happens. Um, and I know I'm running out of time. Um, I'm running a little bit over. I, I do want to mention there are... Oh, 12.15. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I have a clock on my screen up here. Um, but thank you very much. Fantastic. I can relax. I don't have to rush you anymore. All right. All right. Because um, um, I know that not everybody is going to have the ability to um, set up their webcam, go online, um, like Katmai was fortunate enough to do, and Katmai would not be able to do it without the partnership with Explore.org. Their financial and technical support really makes that happen. So I can't thank them enough for making that a reality. Um, and that's not going to be available to everybody. I, I admit that. I know that's that's uh, that's a possibility. But there are other ways that you can reach online audiences. Facebook has the ability for you to stream live. You can make this a regular event. Um, you can stream live on YouTube. You can do a Google Hangout. Uh, you can go on Periscope. Periscope is really great for those impromptu moments. Type in bear fishing at Brooks Falls. Hit, you know, um, and then you know, you're online with your, uh, with your iPhone, interpreting to a very different audience than our typical webcam audience. The few times that I ended up doing Periscope, I found that I was getting questions in that feed that were very, very different than, than um, if I was going into the, the uh, uh, regular live chat with our more typical uh, audience. So this is Shenandoah National Park, where Roy Wood right now um, is the chief of interpretation. is starting to use Facebook Live and finding a lot of success with that. So I encourage you to experiment with these things. Uh, another way that you can uh, chat with people is through Reddit. I don't know why the Park Service isn't on Reddit more often. I don't know if any parks actually are, but there's no reason why we can't be. NASA's like, ask us anything. Why are we on Reddit telling people, ask us anything about our parks, about our site? Uh, I know, and I'll, to be sort of polite, I know there are administrative considerations to using different types of social media. I remember a time where you weren't allowed to use Twitter, for example, as um, officially uh, in national parks, and now everyone's supposed to have their own Twitter channel. But see what is appropriate for your site um, and experiment with these. There are ways that you can, again, reach online audiences who can't physically visit your site. And at the beginning of the program, I sort of introduced an idea uh, about a paradigm in national parks. Again, the idea was you had to get people to physically visit your park. That was how you built awareness and stewardship. You had to build infrastructure, campgrounds, roads, trails, give them this remarkable experience. See how um, you had to physically get people to parks so they can appreciate and understand it and become stewards of the site. There's also, of course, the paradox of wildlife viewing associated with that. 
in areas where people do go to view wildlife, they can have a, a, a strong influence on the animals. But webcams help to break the paradigm, and they can offer some respite from the paradox. And they can reach audiences, again, that never physically visit the site. The experience that people get through webcams is on par. You saw this slide before, but I wanted to bring it back up again, because it is on par or exceeds the on-site experience. So people are finding meaning in our national parks through webcams. They're also extremely engaged. They want to interact with rangers. They want to talk to you. They want to talk to the resource experts. Webcams make parks accessible to everybody. They allow and promote ethical wildlife viewing. They forge connections equivalent to on-site visits and they provide interpreters with an unprecedented reach and platform. I took this photo in July 2009, before there were any webcams at Brooks River. And I was, I there's, can't really see them too well due to the screen resolution, but there's probably a dozen brown bears in that photo. And I was probably sharing the wildlife viewing platform at Brooks Falls with maybe 20 people at the time. It was in the evening, not a lot of people tended to go up there in 2009 in the evening. So it was a remarkable experience for me, but I was only sharing it with a few other people that were there. But why should this experience be limited just to the people who can visit your site? A couple years later, screenshot from the webcam, I was probably on the wildlife viewing platform at that time, and there were several thousand people watching. So we can share this experience with everyone. And there's no reason why we shouldn't try to bring national parks to everyone. And I'm not the only person who thinks this. E.O. Wilson, for example, thinks the same thing. He says, I suggest a means to achieve almost free enjoyment of the world's best places in the biosphere. The cost-benefit ratio would be extremely small. It requires only a thousand or so high-resolution cameras that broadcast live around the clock from sites within reserves. People would still visit any reserve in the world physically, but they could also travel there virtually and in continuing real time with no more than a few keystrokes. With species identification and brief expert commentaries unobtrusively added, the adventure would be forever changing and safe. So some serious conservation biologists are thinking that this is a good idea. And again, I can't agree with them more. Webcams change the game. They allow us to reach nas uh, national park visitors all across the world. Think of that online audience as also a real audience. I'll be happy to take questions from anybody who happens to be here, and thanks for joining me um, this morning. Yeah, Jason. So, Mike, what, what kind of a training would you suggest for a team that's just kind of starting this up? Like what, what type of training is kind of critical for people who may not have the full, over the full plate of skills? Um, it's, yeah, I think with... Oh, sure. <laughs> and I... Um, yeah, I know this is hard to read for everybody, um, so I'll leave this up on the screen until everyone leaves out of the room, so if you want to come up and, and get my contact info that, um, later, if you can't read this, that would be fine. Yeah, uh, training for um, for interpreters and, and a team that may be wanting to, to go into this, I, I would say start with your most experienced interpreters, um, if you're going to put them online. Um, they're going to be practiced uh, with maybe unique situations that might, that, that might come up. Uh, be prepared for anything. You never really know how people are going to react to, to, to stuff on the internet. You, um, it's much harder to kind of uh, gauge a reaction because you can't see people face to face. It, it took me a long time to get used to staring at a camera um, when I didn't have an audience in front of me. That, it's still kind of weird. Um, it, it's actually great to have people in the room instead of just talking to the computer. Uh, so uh, yeah, start with experienced interpreters. Be prepared for anything. Um, but the interpretive um, methodology, I think, is essentially the same. So you're still going to want to try to give people meaningful experiences. Um, uh, link the, uh, the features on your website to universal concepts. So again, preparing for that ahead of time. I think that's, again, if you have those skills, then this um, transferring and, and shifting the focus to an online audience is, can be quite smooth uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. We're not familiar with explore.org. Is that a private, nonprofit? What is it? It's a uh, philanthropic organization. They're not a nonprofit. They don't solicit donations. 
Um, so it's run by um, uh, by uh, Charles Annenberg Weingarten. I hope I got his last name right. Yeah. Um, so part of it, he's uh, you know part of the the, um, the Annenberg um, group of philanthropists. Um, so yeah, they are a philanthropic organization, um, and they do not um, solicit donations. So they're not a nonprofit. And a question. Really? Charging you a monthly rate on that's what I'm trying to get. No, they do they do basically everything free of charge. It's amazing. It's it's really amazing how generous they are with their with their staff and their their um, their expertise and their money. Uh, yeah, so they, they do not charge us a single thing. So do you have to be like a, a governmental agency, a nonprofit to get use of their services? What are their restrictions? Yeah, well, cool story. <laughs> <laughs> They, yeah, they, they actually partner with um, a lot of nonprofit sites. Um, they partner with zoos, with farm sanctuaries, animal, animal rehab centers. They have um, uh, uh, service dog um, webcams, so you get to watch the, uh, the progress of service dogs get trained um, over time. Uh, they have uh, a place where kittens are rescued um, and taken into a shelter. Uh, they have, uh, I think they also partner with Channel Islands National Park. They have some underwater cams. Or Channel Islands, which are quite fascinating, um, and then also they have cameras in Africa too. So they partner with a group in Africa. Um, so yeah, it's just not national parks, but it can also be really anywhere where there's kind of a um, where where there is wildlife. And they also do um, a lot of work and develop a lot of films about people. Uh, so you can check out their website. Their website is explore.org. Um, tons of tons and tons of uh, information on there, and you can you can get lost on explore.org with all, all of their features. And I, I think there's a question in the corner, then I'll be over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, question for you and anyone else in the room that has some ideas. So I know you had said that you were doing the live streaming in the Welcome Center, Visitor Center. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas for activities to engage kids a little bit more with it. So it's kind of, kind of keep hitting the wall. We can, we can only interpret so much. And I think the kids need some activities to really better understand. So looking for ideas. Yeah, um, we, never, we never marketed our live chats uh, towards children specifically. We always kind of thought about it during the off season, but we just never got around to it. But I think with this, um, you could easily just say, hey, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna market this towards, towards children. Um, I, kids love bears, they love animals. Um, so they, it's very easy to get them sort of engaged in that. Um, so I, I wish I could, Answer your question better. I don't know if anyone else in the audience has a yeah, I mean, more experience with children. We do yeah. like free to post activities, um, you know, where, where you, you know, come up to maybe five or one, and then you can post your own activity. Yeah. Um, and then you can kind of put your own activity and then you can kind of put your own activity Thank you. Okay, welcome. Yes, sir. Rear cameras, who's operating the cameras? Is it park staff? It's um it's uh, volunteers uh, through Explore.org. Uh, so we uh, Rangers have the ability to log into the camera controls and pan them if we need to. And I did that occasionally um, when I knew something really cool was happening at the river and I knew the camera was looking at a different spot. I would log in and I would kind of pirate the the controls for a little bit and I would turn it. And usually the the, the volunteers got the idea. Hey, I need to look at this instead of what I was looking at. Uh, but it's it's through. They have um, dozens of. of Webcam volunteers that drive that drive the cameras. Um, so that also is another really kind of incredible thing that Explore.org does for us. We don't have to um, uh, recruit those volunteers. They they do that for us. Yes. So those volunteers, do they have any knowledge of what they're handling? Uh, we we have I mean, given them. Just, just the volunteers that can do the technical side for the students. Yeah, they're they're given. Um, uh, some insider information about where bears go, what they might do. Um, so there's a little bit of that. There's no formal training for them. Um, at least as far as I know, Explore to Work. Okay, so there was the kind of like a lead um, camera operator. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks for correcting me um, on that too. Um, so yeah, they were giving them some, some training on, on, on that. Yes. They're also kind of instructed not to really give much of an opinion about about bears. So they're kind of, again, leaving that to um, the webcam audience to debate amongst themselves and, um, and again, the rangers, of course, who happen to come. Yes. So. 
Sure. You don't want to know the other side. No, that's fine. I'll, I'll be happy to talk longer. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, the, the maintenance can be sometimes quite significant. They break, since Catma is so remote and it's hard to access a lot of um, the cameras, especially um, during certain times of the year, um, they, they do go down. Uh, I don't want to say semi-regularly, but that, it happens. There, there were many days that I spent trying to troubleshoot um, the bear cams. So either hiking up onto Dumpling Mountain to the repeater that was up there, trying to trouble, um, you know, reconnect some wires, replace parts, um, so it, it can be easier, I think, in a place with easier access. Um, but since Katmai is so remote and there's a lot of things that have to happen perfectly for these to be streamed over the internet, that they tend to go down more than uh, a webcam that might happen in a, a more accessible location. And how many webcams do you have on there? So at Katmai, uh, there, um, there can be six webcams. There's not always bandwidth to stream six cameras. But uh, up to six cameras um, can be streaming footage. And all of the footage is actually downloaded to a server, too. Not all of it's streamed on the internet, but it's all downloaded to a server. So at some point in the future, somebody can really mine that information for who knows what they could find out about brown bears um, at, at Brooks River. So there's also that, that aspect to it. Uh, you, you can do some citizen science things if you, um, if you made that information available to the audience at large. Um, it's it's really difficult in King Salmon. Uh, the the internet speed is generally slow. Uh, we were getting yeah you know, like upload speeds maybe five ten megabits a second in some cases. So it's pretty slow. Uh, That's a per camera. That yeah. I and I my numbers are probably going to be wrong. I'd have to look that up. Um, so so I don't I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that um. When I did speed tests through like the, the internet connection when I was doing like live programs, yeah, upload speed sometimes was reaching five megabits a second. It will, the the download speed maybe ten megabits a second. So, but um, in you know in a remote Alaska, it's not like internet that we have here. I did a speed test in this room like a couple days ago, and it was the upload speed was like 180 megabytes a second. It was amazing. So yeah. you come from a rural place like um, like uh, rural Alaska. It is is very very different. Um, so that was a, that's a big challenge. It's also extremely expensive. So Explorer work probably pays tens of thousands of dollars per month just for internet, um, and that's again something that the government wouldn't be able to afford. Uh, and, and, but in the lower 48, again, a park that's in an area where you have better internet access, the costs aren't. It goes straight to King Salmon. So Dumpling Mountain is line of sight to King Salmon. And fiber optic cable. Yes, yeah, fiber way, um, yeah, fiber optic cable to the, to the rest of the world. said it was 1.5 megabits per cam. 1.5, okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, 1.5 megabits per cam. Okay. Yeah. And so we had, we had trouble getting that. So um, it, was, it was kind of a challenge. Yes, one more question. How often yeah. is the camera on? Um, we want it. Well, what do you do when nothing's going on? Focus. Well, to answer your second question, what do we do when nothing's going on? Um, that allows us sometimes to focus on other projects. Because um, again, I wanted to donate or dedicate full time work to the webcams, but I had to do like the, new, the park newspaper, the park websites, all those other things. So in the winter time, we ended up um, focusing on different projects. So it's just but, in the background. Yeah, we kind of, yeah, that was, it, it, it would kind of like, you know, be kind of secondary to some of those projects in the winter. Um, but the idea was to have this streaming live year round. Um, so it is generally worked summer through early fall. And then um, as the sun starts to dip lower and lower across the horizon, daylight is less and less. Um, and the fuel cells burn out and solar power is less. Then um, the, the webcams uh, have a harder time. Going live because they just don't have the power. Does it, does it yes. have they did, um, and they still do. Most of the time, it's turned off. Um, there was an inf or there is an infrared emitter at Brooks Falls, but it draws so much juice that it's really really hard um, to to use that. So a lot of times, it, it is uh, turned off. 
Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so if anybody's still here who has technical questions, um, Roy Wood, um, and I, I can give you his email address. He knows the technical um, stuff um, better than I. So I'll be happy to give you his, his contact information. Sounds great. This, um, the, uh, this, the whole presentation will be um, streamed or uh, put up on Explorador's YouTube channel. Um, I also plan on uploading this to uh, to like a Google Doc, and and I'll just make that um, shareable for everybody who has the link. So I'll be happy to, to do that for you. Do you have a keynote or PowerPoint? You don't don't care. And, uh, okay, I'll make sure I have both. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and Bear Camp fans, if you are still watching, thanks for uh, joining me today. I hope um, you enjoyed the program, and I will uh, talk to you later.